Amen. You may be seated. And how blessed are we that he can read directly from the Torah? <laughs> Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. All right. The year is not 2016. The year, for the sake of the drash today, is 537 BC. Place is Rushalayim. B'nai Israel have just returned from their extended vacation, <laughs> captivity, in Babylon. Some have been gone from their homeland for as much as 70 years. Others have been gone about 50 years. They were sent to captivity. Why? Well, it's part of God's judgment. It eventually catches up with us, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Generations of disobedience. Now at last, the first wave of Jews are returning to the land. But everything has changed since they've left. It's the way it is sometimes. It reminds me of the pretender song. I went back to Ohio, but my city was gone. There was no train station. There was no one at home. The countryside is in the hands of their enemies. The city of Yerushalayim lies in ruins. The walls have been torn down and buildings have been looted. And worst of all, the worst part of it all was the temple that Shlomo or Solomon had built 500 years earlier. It's no more. It's gone. All that's left, uh, just uh, a pile of rocks. So complete was the devastation that it seemed as if the temple in all its glory was just some kind of like dream, like it never really happened. The Babylonians, of course, they took all the gold, they took all the silver, and everything else of value. The Ark of Covenant was gone, uh, all their sacrifices gone, temple implements gone, all, all looted and taken. Perhaps being especially motivated because it was Tishrei and the holy days were upon the people, they were very inspired to go to work. They were determined to clean up this mess. And they began first with the altar, to rebuild the altar. And then uh, they went to relay the foundation for the temple. And then finally they paused. They paused for praise, paused for celebration. As I read from the book of Ezra, chapter 3, verse 12, in the midst of the cheering and the singing, a strange thing happens. Many of the Kohanim, the scripture says, Levi'im, heads of the father's clans, the old men, who had seen the first house standing on its foundation, they wept out loud when they saw this house, while others shouted out for joy. Shouted loudly for joy so that the people couldn't distinguish the noise of the joyful shouting from the noise of the people's weeping. For the people were shouting so loudly that the noise could be heard at a great distance. So you have this kind of unique scene here where the young people are jumping up and down and dancing and rejoicing while the old folks are bent over crying, weeping, crocodile tears. It's... The shouts of joy is mixed with the weeping, and you couldn't tell the difference. It was really kind of an odd scene. But if you do the math, it all makes sense. See, the temple had been destroyed in 586 B.C. Fifty years later, B'nai Israel returns from captivity, and they begin to rebuild the temple. Now, the older folks who could remember Shlomo's temple at that time, we're probably about the mid-60s, give or take a year. Meanwhile, the two whole generations have been born in Babylon. And those young people had no memory of the glories of Solomon's temple. So they grew up in a pagan Babylon. And they were cheering the beginning of a new temple. But to the old folks, it was like comparing a mobile home to a mansion. No offense. How pitifully small it seemed to them when compared with what they had once known. And their disappointment was so great that they wept while others 
rejoiced. Everyone here knows disappointment. Everyone here knows disappointment one time or another, or maybe you're experiencing it right now. It comes in a variety of forms. I don't think I had the time to illustrate all the many types of disappointments. How about friends breaking their word, disappointed in you? How about marriages that end in divorce, promises broken, our children move away, they never call us? Colleagues that we work with betray us? Maybe you got laid off recently from somewhere you were. Maybe the doctor's treatment that you hoped would cure the problem doesn't. Maybe our investments disappear, the market crashes, our dreams are shattered. The best laid plans, as often said, go astray. Other believing brothers and sisters disappoint us. Very often we just disappoint ourselves. We kick ourselves in the butt if we could, saying, why do I keep doing that same stupid thing? We live in a world of disappointment. And if we do not come to grips with this truth, we are doing to be unhappier tomorrow than we are today. There's an English author, his name is Joseph Addison, and he declared this, Our real blessings often appear to us in the shape of pains, losses, and disappointments. Maybe you've heard the story of Alexander the Great, who wept because there was no more worlds to conquer. Years ago, it's a funny story, that many of you that are into sports or into baseball know the to know Joe Torrey. He's a great baseball player. He was a broadcaster at this time for the California Angels, now the Anaheim Angels. And during a broadcast one night, he mentioned that a little boy had asked him before the game, hey, did you used to be somebody? <laughs> and perhaps you've heard Abraham Lincoln's reply when he was asked how it felt to lose the race. He lost many of them before he became president. He lost the race for U.S for the U.S. Senate to Stephen Douglas in 1858. He said, well, I feel like the boy who stubbed his toe. I am too big to cry and too badly hurt to laugh. <laughs> Dr. Jerome Frank of John Hopkins University in Baltimore talks about our assumptive world. I often think about that. Do you? You think about the assumptions that people make. I think one of the greatest assumptions people make is their salvation. <clears throat> it's amazing to me how many people live their lives assuming they're going to heaven. How would you risk something like that? How could you be so arrogantly assumptive? But Dr. Jerome, he, what he means by our assumptive world is that we all make certain assumptions about life. And often our assumptions are unstated. Deep down we believe, we won't say it, but we believe if we do certain things, others will treat us a certain way. Right? Right? A lot of you do something to get something in return. Relationships are often like that. People get married today not because they want to give their lives to the other person, but they want the other person to give their lives for them. <laughs> That's why they get married, because it benefits them. Rather than being, having the attitude of benefiting the other person in this relationship. We all assume that we have earned certain things out of life. That's right. I deserve this, right? I deserve that. If those expectations are not met, what happens? Eeyore. Eeyore. I watched a lot of Winnie the Pooh as a young, as a young father. A lot of Winnie the Pooh. I've seen a lot of Eeyore. Disappointment. And there is a strong correlation between good mental health and having assumptions that match reality. And there's a high correlation between misplaced assumptions and a variety of emotional problems, including, for some, depression. But put simply, we are, disappointed. we are disappointed when things don't go the way we thought they were going to go, or should go. We're disappointed. 
And wrong expectations lead to disappointment, and disappointment leads to despair. Why were the old people disappointed? Well, they remembered, for one thing, how good things used to be. And because they were living in the past with all its glory, they could not deal with the present reality. If you're ever going to overcome that sort of disappointment, three things are very necessary when you're dealing with how things used to be. We've got to do what God's people did in Ezra 3. First thing they did was they rebuilt the altar. Why is that significant? Well, I'm going to tell you that's why. Standing up here. The returning exiles began by rebuilding the altar so they could offer sacrifices to God. They built an altar. The very first thing they wanted to do was have the opportunity to appropriately give to God. Isn't that funny? I often want to ask believers whether they go to Sunday church or Messianic congregation. I really want to ask them sometimes. I'm going to assume that you, being assumptive, I'm going to assume that you believe. Why do you come? Why do you come to a Shabbat service? Do you ever think about that? Do you come because it's Shabbat and I'm supposed to be in shul? Do you come because you got some friends here? You like the social interaction? Do you come because you like praise and worship? Do you like to hear from the Torah? Do you like a lot of different reasons. You have to think about that sometime. Why do you really come to a Shabbat service? What really motivates your first ambition or drive to be here on Shabbat? What makes you get up and say, I've got to get to the Star on the because it's Shabbat? What is driving you? What is moving you to be here? For God's people, was to have the opportunity to offer sacrifices. If you look in Ezra, it notes that all the people, as one man, the scripture says, assembled in Jerusalem. And the two key leaders knew what to do. Yeshua the high priest, Zerubbabel, the man who led the exiles back from Babylon, led the people and reconstructed the altar of God. And when it was finished, they began to offer the morning and evening sacrifices as God had mandated in the priestly mantle, mantle, uh, manual. Leviticus. Then they made offerings. It was about that time, by the time they got the altar built, it was about time for Sukkot, or Feast of Tabernacles. And scripture says, and afterwards, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings for the Rosh Hokadesh, and those for all the designated times set apart for Adonai, as well as those of everyone who volunteered a voluntary offering. Volunteered. It's very interesting. Volunteered a voluntary offering. To Adonai. From the first day of the seventh month, they began offering burnt offerings to Adonai, even though the foundation of Adonai, Adonai's temple hadn't even been laid yet. They never built the house, let alone lay the foundation. But the first thing they did, they built that altar. They built the altar first. Why? Because everything about our walk with the Lord begins from a sacrificial giving spirit. That's where it starts. That's why I ask you the question. It is tragic to me, tragic, that I can be in the fellowship of Messianic believers and they will beat you up one side or another about Shabbat, about High Holy Days, about kosher. And boy, don't you ever talk about giving. There's no passion there. There's no conviction there. The Torah really isn't as important there as it is for those other areas of significance. And they are very significant. But even as the people of the way, we pick and choose. We're guilty of it. How tragic it is to have 50 people and get 100 bucks. The offering was. That is called rebuke, which I taught on two weeks ago. We 
You want to get it right. So out of the rubble of their past disobedience, they made sure their hearts from this point on were going to be right. We're going to rebuild this right. We're going to do it right. We're going to get our priorities correct. And so by making the sacrifices first, they were saying, Lord, we're going to, we're, we're going to get our attitude and our spirit right before we build anything. The altar was a symbolic center of their faith in Hashem, and it is ours as well. And it was the place where they brought their lambs and their goats and bulls to be offered by God. That was, that was their wealth. That's what they had. And without the altar, there could be no proper worship. There could be no assurance of divine protection. No guarantee of forgiveness. No access to God. And no lifting the burden of guilt and failure. The altar was the link between God and humankind. And during all the years of Babylon, the people had no altar and thus no clear access to God and no assurance that they were a forgiven people. And their disobedience had taken the altar away and broken their fellowship with God. There are times, as going to be exemplified this afternoon as we go to the mikvah, there are seasons where we all need a new, fresh start, a new beginning with Hashem. We all need it. Sometimes we need a new beginning because of our own dirt, our own sin. Sometimes the circumstances of life have so defeated us, and we've got such a pathetic attitude that we need a fresh start. And sometimes we feel that hope is gone forever. And in those moments, we must do what God's people did. We must return to the altar of sacrifice for believers, that means returning to the tree where Yeshua's blood was shed Amen. for every one of us here. And often we wonder if God will take us back or will, will he turn me away? The answer is yes, he will take you back, but you'll never know until you make that journey on your own. I could tie you up to the back of my boat and drag you into the water, or you can make that journey yourself. <laughs> No matter how great your sin may be, if we turn to the Lord, He pardons abundantly. Who is a God like you, pardoning the sin and overlooking the crimes of the remnant of His heritage? He does not retain His anger forever because He delights. He delights in grace. He loves to do that. So we rebuild the altar. That's what the people did. The second thing they did is they relayed the foundation. With the relationship reestablished with God, because they rebuilt the altar, B'nai Israel proceeded to relay the foundation of the temple, and this involved a massive cleanup effort. Remember when they came back, they found basically rubble. It kind of looked, if you can imagine, if you've ever seen those pictures, I know my mom growing up <coughs> in Germany while I had the crap bombed out of it. I have pictures and albums at home of her standing piles of rubble, no chin, nowhere to live, nothing to eat. And that's what it looked like. They basically looked like a pile of rubble. And where Solomon's temple had been, they found a field, wood, piles of rocks, weeds, bushes, growing among the debris. It was a train wreck. And when the, there was nothing there that really looked like a temple. They had been completely destroyed, torn down, burned. So we read from Ezra chapter 3, verse 7, they also gave money. They also gave money for the stone workers and carpenters, as well as food. That's probably one of David Lindstrom's favorite verses. They also gave money for the stone workers and carpenters, as well as food, drink, and olive oil for the people of Sodom and Tzor, bringing cedar logs to the Lebanon, to the sea and on the Afo, in accordance with the authorization granted by Koresh, king of Persia. And in the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Yerushalayim in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Sha'atiel, Yeshua, the son of Yotzadach, the rest of their kinsmen, the Kohanim and the Levi'im, and all who had come out to, of exile to Yerushalayim began the project. And they appointed the Levi'im, aged 20 and up, 
to direct work in the house of Adonai. And so two facts of this jump out at us. First, they committed themselves to follow the Lord in the details of life. They resolved to do it God's way. Not the traditional way, not their family's way, not the culture's way, not the church's way, not the worldly way, not the American way. They did it God's way. The way. Verses 2 and 4 emphasize that when they rebuilt the altar, they did it according to the Torah. They followed the details of what God had instructed Moshe to do. And that's a significant because nearly a thousand years had passed since God had spoken his Torah and lots of water had passed under the bridge in those intervening centuries. Now it was time to start over. So what do you do then? Like anything else. When my house was built, you looked at the plans, the blueprint. I was sitting in my office last night, and I'm, I'm pointing out to Rochelle and my children, I say, you see that corner right there? That was the very first corner with my house. And there's a Bible right there buried at the foot. That's the very first corner built. Start from the beginning. Start with the instructions. Start with the basics. You read the instruction manual. When all else fails, you read the instructions, right? So you don't make the same ignorant mistakes over and over and over again. And that's what they did in Ezra 3. Secondly, they relayed the foundation in spite of the enemies that are all around them. As the story unfolds in the chapters that follow, those enemies will do everything possible to discourage them. Remember I told you many, many messages back, that's the enemy's favorite tool in his tool chest. His favorite tool is discouragement. God is an encourager. Hasatan, being the Antichrist, is a discourager. Favorite tool. So all that the enemies want to do was discourage them, harass them, oppose them, and stop the project altogether. And you're a work in progress. Why do we have so many walking wounded? Because you're a work in progress. You have decided to do it God's way. And so I can see him just, the enemy just picking them off one by one. I can predict who's not going to be here at Shabbat. I can predict it. Because I know who the vulnerable ones are and where they are vulnerable. And, God, and, and Hasidah just sits back and goes, oh, the ducks in the pond. Picks them off. What happens in the physical is, is the same as what happens in the spiritual. That's why we have illustrations. So you can connect what, in the physical what's going on in the spiritual. And in fact, the enemies do succeed for a period of time. It takes courage and determination to stand against the hostile world. It does. Are you well received because you are followers of the way? It's a hostile environment. Especially if you're in an environment you think is following the way and you discover it isn't. Oh my gosh. You've got the Christians coming at you from one direction, you've got the Jews coming at you from another direction, and you've got some Messianists coming at you from another direction. takes courage. And what defeats the enemy when he lines up against you is your faith. Put your faith ahead of your fears. In spite of the rubble, in spite of the opposition, in spite of all that happened in the past, the people banded together. They got to work. They got to work. They raised money to buy these cedar logs. They organized the workers and teams. And everyone pitched in. Everyone pitched in. And went to work. They picked up those huge boulders. I got some of my property. They're not light. And I don't like moving them. I like digging them up. I was working on my yard yesterday with 85, 90 degrees out there. 
How did I look yesterday, Carol? I looked whipped. Terrible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Think I worked yesterday? Darn right I did. Dragging them boulders around my property. That's what I was doing. Getting ready for this today and for later today. They cut down all the bushes. I was cutting grass yesterday. I dug up weeds. I was clearing weeds. Clearing out broken timber and jagged pieces of metal. It was hot there. I know what it's like. Little by little, day by day, week by week, they work to clean out a half century of neglect. Don't miss the point. When you are disappointed and you don't know what to do, take this lesson from God's people. You can't stay in bed and lethargic forever. Oh, I know I shouldn't go there. So much of your problems that you struggle with today are self-imposed. And they're self-imposed because you don't get off your tuchus and change them. If you got knee problems, why do you have knee problems? Because you weigh too much. Lose the weight. I know that because my knees hurt when I'm weighing another 20 pounds than I should. If things always seem to be disappointed and, and, and you have a lot of life to see really sad and despair, it's because your attitude. 90% of what happens in your life is based upon your attitude and how you approach it. Self-imposed, self-fulfilling prophecy. You either speak life or you speak death. It's you. And it was them. They got off their butts. Someone has to mop the floor. Someone has to take out the trash. Someone has to open the office. Someone has to turn on the lights. Someone has to pay the bills. Someone has to fix the motor. Someone has to enter the data. Someone has to make charts. Someone has to make lesson plans. Someone has to see the patients. Someone has to grade the papers. Somebody has to drive the trucks. Someone has to watch the kids. Someone has to fix this. Move that. Build that. Take care of that. Don't let your discouragement keep you from doing what you know you have to do. If you can't keep your big promises, try the small ones. Try the little ones. Do those. If you can't follow the big plan, follow a small one. If you can't see ten steps in the future, take two. Take one. Motivational speaker John Maxwell said the smallest act of obedience, the smallest act of obedience is better than the greatest intention. And he's right. Better to do a little than to sit around dreaming about doing a lot. When I look at all the stuff I have to do, I keep speaking to myself. How do you eat an elephant? Mike, how do you eat an elephant? Thank you. I know you know the answer to that. One bite at a time. One bite at a time. Better to do a little than sit around dreaming about doing a lot. They can't obey God in some grand gesture. Then obey in the small things of life. Do you know what needs to be done? Do for the glory of God. If I had a lot of people do a little bit for the glory of God, you guys would be amazed. You would be amazed. You would be amazed. Rebuild the altar. You lay the foundation, and then resolve yourself to praise the Lord. And so I refer back to Ezra chapter 3, verse 10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of Adonai, the Kohanim, in their robes with trumpets, and the Levi'im, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, they took their places to praise Adonai. As David, king of Israel, had instructed, they sang antiphonally, praising giving thanks to Adonai for he is good for his grace continues forever. His grace continues forever towards Israel and all the people raised a great shout of praise to Adonai because the foundation of the house of Adonai had been laid. And once the foundation was laid, the people and their leaders stopped and gave thanks to God. 
Giving thanks is an attitude. It's an attitude. In unity, they openly and they passionately praise Hashem. When they sang and declared He is good, not we are good. Look at what we did. Look at what Adam and I did. Look at what God did. They didn't even say we did this with God's help. They openly gave God all the credit. And I'm struck by the fact that they did not wait until the building was done to praise the Lord. Now they can't do that until the building is done. Even though laying the foundation was significant, there was a mountain of work that was left to do. Years would, listen to me, this is important, years would pass, years before the temple was finished. It's no different for us as a congregation. It's taken us years to get this. We still praise the Lord in this. In fact, we first moved in here. Remember that? Remember that glass we first moved in here? Bare floor. Cur we hung curtains up. There were the walls. There was nothing. It was just a big open space. We praise the Lord. Right? Same thing when we moved to the corner, carried the tour up, up the street, we walked that tour all the way up Middle Branch, went in there, it was a big open room with the wallpaper falling down and drywall had been used in eight, nine years. We put a sound system in there, we jammed, worshiped with the Lord. Amen? Worship and praise God. Same here. It's taken us years to get where we're at now. It'll probably take a few more years to get it done. One bite at a time. This was their only first step, but they stopped anyway and gave thanks to the Lord. And I'm telling you, that's a lesson for all of us. Many times you just don't feel like praising the Lord. Many times you just don't. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Praise isn't about your feelings. Don't live your life according to your feelings. They deceive you. Praise is a choice. Love is a choice. You choose it. And you do so apart from any regard for your feelings. And he was exactly right. Don't wait until the victory is won to praise the Lord. Stop and praise him before the battle is begun. And then praise him in the midst of the battle. And praise him when things are going against you. Do what B'nai Israel did and praise him for a good beginning. That will put your soul in the right place and help you to continue working with joy for the days that will come. It's a great advance in the spiritual life. If you can praise the Lord when things are not going well, that is the challenge for you this morning. When things, you're disappointed and things are not going your way, can you honestly praise the Lord? Because this is the key to it. If you're able to do that, then you can honestly say, I'm not of, I'm not of this world. We're in it, but I'm not of it. Because if you struggle with praising the Lord when things are going your way, then it kind of lends us to be to believe you're more of the world. Because your feelings are conditional upon your environment. But if you're able to praise the Lord in the midst of whatever this world is dishing out to you, then you're just passing through because you're not of this world. You're ambassadors of the kingdom. And you, as ambassadors, you represent the joy and the promise of the kingdom. This doesn't matter to you. This doesn't affect you. Do the best you can with what you've been given. But this is not my home. And that will be the proof of it. Not letting things get you down. In the midst of the devastation of Jerusalem, with only the foundation of the temple relayed with rubble on every hand after returning to their, find their homeland controlled by their enemies, still the people said in one voice, God is good. Just like Joshua and Caleb. It's good. Good land. Let's take it. Get it. And that's faith, brothers and sisters. That's faith. Anyone can praise God when the sun is shining. All the bills are paid. 
Marriage is good. Kids are doing well. Just got a raise. Future is bright. Think of wear shades. It's something else to praise God when things are far from perfect. It's a great thing to be able to look at your life and say, it's not what I wish it was, but God is still good. So, that's dealing with the past. But why did the young people rejoice? Because Babylon is all they knew. That was their world. They'd never seen Shlomo's temple. They didn't remember its glory, hadn't witnessed its destruction. All they knew about that, they had heard from their parents, and parents' friends, and the older generation told them tales of the old days, the good old days. The Beatles. Remember the Beatles? Yeah. Well, you know who the Beatles are. <laughs> Evan likes the Beatles. He likes the Beatles. Bless his heart. Good old days. Right? Right? We all talk about the good old days. Yeah, we used to play outside until dark. And mother would say, come home when the street lights are on. Right? Everybody's going, yeah. And Allison's going, what? <laughs> what? What are you talking about? What? Good old days. But these young people, they didn't know that. They never experienced that. So when they saw the temple foundation relate to them, it was just an amazing answer to prayer. It was a miracle that related that temple. And it was the closest thing to the temple that they'd ever seen. And they saw no reason to weep. This is the time to celebrate. This is the time to celebrate God's greatness. But I, but I don't think we should be hard on the old folks. They remembered how good things had been, and they recalled what had been lost through disobedience. And that was important that they would remember that. And it was well that they should weep, and even better, that they should pass on those lessons of disobedience they learned through their bitter experience many years before. It's still true today, and this is so important that we understand this, that the young need the old to remind them of the past. The old need the young to encourage them about the future. We need each other. We need each other. William? Get Daniel. Daniel. As we stand back and survey all that's transpired to Israel in the temple, there are four lessons that I want to close up with that stand out to help us over not only deal with disappointment, but overcome it. Overcome disappointment. First of all, you just got to yield all your memories and dreams to Adonai. You just got to give him. If you all put it on the altar, you got to give it up. Was your past better and happier than your present? Okay, yield it to the Lord. Was your past filled with sadness and pain? Well, you give that to the Lord too. Okay? You had great dreams, bright hopes, big plans for the future? Well, that's great. Good. We should have goals, ambitions, dreams. It's good to dream big, but in all your dreaming and all your hoping and all your planning, yield it to God. The Lord gives, the Lord takes. Who knows? Lay it at his feet and say, your will be done. Your will be done. And rejoice in that. Not kicking and screaming all the way to that phrase. Your will be done. <laughs> <laughs> Grinding your teeth while you're saying it. <laughs> Take the past with its happiness and its sadness. Take the future with all its unlimited possibilities and give it all, past and present, to the Lord. Say to him, Lord, you are the God of yesterday and you are the God of tomorrow. And you'll yield them both to you say, I may live for your glory today. So that's what you have. What is it? Yesterday is a canceled check. Tomorrow is a promissory note. And today is cash. <laughs> got cash today. Spend it. Next thing, besides healing your memories and dreams, accept your present situation is from Hashem. And to accept does not mean that you passively resign yourself to your circumstances. That's not a call to give up and stop fighting for what you believe in. But it does mean accepting the reality that where you are at right now 
is where God wants you to be and what he wants you to do. Because if God wanted you to be somewhere else, if you're submitted to him in relationship, then by golly, you, you're going to be somewhere else then. His will will be done. Only those who have a high view of God can come to this conclusion. Only those who can stand in the mirror in the morning and go, how great is our God! Not picking on her, but that's the spirit and attitude. A high view of God. Sometimes you must come to the certainty by a conscious choice of heart. Blessed is the person who can say, I am here by sovereign choice of loving God, and I am loathed that the Lord makes no mistakes. It doesn't mean it's wrong to change your situation if you need to, and you can, but it gives you the bedrock confidence that higher hands are at work in your life, and that what you are dealing with and living is in the control of God. So yield your memories and dreams, accept your present situation, and then resolve to obey God right where you are. Obey Him. Disappointment may cause bitterness, and bitterness may make us lethargic toward the duties of life. We may find a thousand excuses not to do the things we know we ought to do. I don't get it sometimes. <laughs> I was watching a guy at work. <laughs> you know, you just, you just, you know, he's, over, he's a little overweight, and, he, and he, he just got, spending a week, figuring out that he had a bleeding ulcer. Oh, wow. Okay, he got a bleeding ulcer. Nice job. So he comes in for lunch, packing a big Whopper and fries, and a Coke, and I'm looking like, you know, you just, you just want to, well, you just want to do something, you know, yeah. to do. You know, it's just, it just doesn't connect. Another guy, 40, 50, his 50th birthday, has a heart attack. Well, of course, he smokes. So, gee, I wonder how that happened. You know, we find excuses. Well, if I quit smoking, I'll gain weight. Or... You know, I don't have enough money, I don't have time or money to cook for myself. Or There's always an excuse. There's always an excuse. And little by little, things begin to slide. Jobs not done, chores not finished, projects left uncompleted, phone calls not returned, appointments not met. I go on and on, messages not answered, papers not written, goals. And we just slide in this bottomless pit of excuses, despair. And the answer is so simple, we often miss it. Resolve in your heart that you obey God right where you're at. Just resolve you're going to do it. And do it. No delays, no excuses, no hoping for better days, happy times, better weather, favorable experiences, a good mood. If things aren't what you wish they were, well, what do you think the answer to that is? Do something about it. Just do something about it. If I was wanting to complain, I'm not. I was whining and playing about some sort of, like, maybe I wanted to be able to bench 250 pounds or something. Okay. I can say, you know, someday I'd like to do that. Someday. And ten, another year goes by, and like, someday I'd like to do that. You know, I think I could do that. Someday, the next year goes by, someday I'd like to do that. And then all of a sudden you say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make that happen. I want to be able to do that. What do you do? You do something about it. You just do it. You take the first step. All right? Who knows, your willingness to do what needs to be done may change the way things are. And even if the situation doesn't improve, you can hardly make it worse by doing what needs to be done. You can't make it worse. And if you somehow figure out a way to make it worse, at least you had the satisfaction of knowing that you made it worse by doing your duty. <laughs> and not by giving up and throwing in the towel. What does Ecclesiastes say? One of my favorite biblical books. Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whatever you choose to do, do it the best you can and as hard as you can. And finally, praise God for the goodness in spite of your circumstances. And that's what the people of God did in Ezra did. They rolled up their sleeves, got to work, and as they worked, you know, the fulfillment of the dreams was still far in the future. They still praised the Lord every step. And let this be a 
basis of your attitude of thanksgiving. God's goodness is proved not only what he gives, but also what he allows. And hard times are hard precisely because they force you out of the comfort zone, like we talked about last Shabbat or two Shabbats ago. They force you out of your comfort zone. And what I say about comfort zones, nothing grows in a comfort zone. Nothing grows there. So God's going to force you out of his comfort zones every chance he has and put you in a place where you are forced to trust him. And move from this life of theory to a life of reality. And you can hear all the sermons you want about how God takes care of his children, but it's not until you experience it for yourself that those truths become the liberating foundation of your life cannot be blown away by adversity. I found this quote. It's a good quote. One can learn about sailing in the classroom, but it takes rough seas to make a great sailor. Right, Mr. David? It takes rough seas to make a great sailor. I can tell you, somebody asked me the other day, can you fly a plane? I can't remember we got the subject. Said, yes, I can fly a plane. I'm not licensed to fly a plane, but I can fly a plane. And you know what strikes fear and me flying a small plane. Have you ever dealt with a crosswind? Like a little plane? You're like, no, 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 you're fine. And you're lining up on the runway and everything's right lined up. And they get these little lights that tell you you're the right altitude, you're right, you know, um, down the line to be able to land, you know. <clears throat> so I'm all lined up and all of a sudden, I notice the plane's going this way. <laughs> you know? I don't want the plane to go this way because I'm flying into a crosswind across the runway. It's frightening because what means is you've got to tip the wing and you've got to kind of torque the, the plane a little bit so it's kind of